I've only got five slides. I'm going to concentrate on three of them because I've also been sitting in the audience uh, getting hungry. Uh, Mike Haley, I'm from CIFAS, we're the UK's fraud prevention service, membership organisation, not for profit. 600 organisations, including all the retail banks. And it's the retail banks in the UK that are getting hit by the cost of scams. I've been asked to do three things. Um, what does the data tell us about the size of the problem in the UK? Why is the UK particularly um, targeted uh, around scams? And often I feel in the, in, in the UK, we feel like we're in the front line. And I think we are in the front line for a number of reasons. But that means we've tried a lot of stuff to try to reduce fraud. So that's what I want to share with you. So what's going to be done and what we're doing now and what more needs to be done. So quickly, um, am I going the right way? That's going the wrong way. No, no, it's the right way. I think. <laughs> that's, a small, I was, that's a surprise to me. Um, so I will just speak to my notes. So what's the size of the scam problem in the UK? Well, I, I've been long in the tooth. Uh, about 2008, 9 or 10, I was here in Holland and we were talking, I think it was the start of the International Mass Marketing Fraud Working Group at the time. Yeah. Scams then were largely through uh, post, post. They used to send loads of stuff through the post to people, which were scams, uh, and email was just starting to be a big issue. At that time, I estimated fraud, mass marketing fraud UK was 1 billion. I thought people would like to scoff at that. And clearly it was by taken as like yeah it's absolute that way clearly there's been this greater sophistication from postal and email scams now and most of that was cashed out through western union the big difference now is the cashing out through banks and i say why that's really important for actually taking the fight to uh, fraud scams now known because it goes through the banks in the uk it's authorized push payment fraud so there's unauthorized fraud someone takes over your account but authorized is because you've taken an action you've been persuaded to be actually mandate a payment. And so now the banks have to pay attention. Uh, in the last, oh, that's the, that's the slide. Um, <laughs> the last year, UK Finance, the Association for the Banking Community, estimated, or they, they reported to them, the fraud problem through banks was 609 million pounds overall, all fraud. More than half, 360 million is through authorized push payment for what we've been talking about today about scams. So it's now for the first time bigger than card fraud, card not present fraud. Card, card skimming, card fraud has been the hugest problem for banks for a long time. Now this is the top of the agenda. Some other uh, facts about what's the scale of the problem. We have a reporting center called Action Fraud through police gets hundreds of thousands of reports a year. They, they've shown that in the last 12 months, 145 million pound known loss just to cryptocurrency investment scams. Speaking to a colleague in Santander Bank, one of our smaller retail banks, one million pounds per month is lost by their customers to cryptocurrency scams. An average of 13,000 pounds per victim. It's a significant impact on individuals. I don't even have 13,000 pounds, but if I had it and lost it all, I think I'd be devastated. And I think, you know, that type of scale for an ordinary person is really significant. One go through the types of scams that we have. We know them, business email compromise, investment scams, purchase scams and delivery scams uh, are, are the kind of most prominent overall, but there's always the ones that come along to take advantage of what's happening now. So energy crisis in the UK, probably across Europe, big increase, um, scammers pretending to be from energy companies. Through the pandemic, they pretended to be the NHS. What I really noticed is the big difference is so difficult to determine what's a genuine um, communication from your energy company or the health service and now from those companies, extraordinarily difficult to do. So why is, the, why is this is about targeting the UK? Why do they target the UK? Well. I think, first of all, it seems like they do because we have really good information. So that information from UK finance, we have a national fraud reporting centre for action fraud. So we start collating together. We bring together reports to CIFAS, my organisation, from all our members, UK finance, uh, through directed action fraud, and bring that together and you can get a really good picture. And it's a significant, a, magnif you know, a, a massive problem. Why did it come to the UK so much? I think we were one of the first countries to introduce faster payments. Instant payments through the banking system means that you can, rather than to try to persuade someone to go to a Western Union store somewhere with a scam money, hand over cash. So you've got to get them to the ATM and then to a Western Union 
lots of particularly older people in the UK would not have used Western Union or MoneyGram. So there's going to be a dropout. People start thinking, oh, I really want to do this. On your app at home, just being able to instantly send that money has created a bigger issue. Online banking, we're also kind of um, at the forefront of open banking, means more entry points into the system to initiate payments. Ease of opening accounts. Uh, we've seen a, a massive growth in the number of app-based banks, which allow you to set up um, just an, a, an, an app bank. That has lo- led to the growth in money yield accounts. So for every scam and every payment that's been sent, it's got to be cashed out somewhere. That tends to be cashed out in what are called money mule accounts. Uh, why in England, demographics, the English language, we're all speaking even here in, in the Netherlands, means that scammers have got that common language. So we, we tend to get all those scams. Um, demographics, growing elderly population with assets are a target for a lot of fraudsters. Although I think we're also seeing, as George pointed out, that our younger demographics now being um, attacked, particularly around cryptocurrency investments. The prevalence and reach of online platforms, UK, very similar. So many people on social media, pretty much all the time. Uh, scammers use um, their user-generated advertisements, but also pay for advertisements. And consumers, because there's been low interest rates until recently, been looking for higher returns on investments, the so crypto and other investment scams. And there's also something we were just talking about in the bar last night, in that I've seen in the UK over the last few years now that there's been a glorification and a cultural acceptance of fraud. So young people actually see that they want to get into fraud. They're called fraud stars in the UK. They'll be the ones who turn up at school gates in, in flash cars and flash clothes. It's a successful business that you people want to get into. I, I used to use, show, show this slide that in my own but near where I live in Poplar in East London, near Canary Wharf, someone has sprayed up do fraud above the ATM. You know, there's a kind of social like, acceptability of doing fraud against the banks. Um, and also a lot of that is scam money. So lots of eight reasons there for, I think, why the UK is particularly prevalent. Um, what happens in terms of, I think lots of people will be talking about this. So I won't go into it. I see fraud as a, uh, scams as a crime of persuasion. And instead of perhaps the um, looking through the prism of actors, which I think George talked earlier, I think you can look at it in terms of, the anatomy of the scam. You need this communication. That's why I've been talking so much about phishing, haven't we? How do you get through on mass communication methods to um, millions of marks? SMS, you know, uh, email and phone calls, that's mission phishing, phishing, utilizing communication techniques and developed by genuine marketers. I think it was mentioned earlier, so many scammers are excellent marketers. They've learned all their lyrics to be about marketing from genuine marketers. Then there's the um, stage of engagement. Scammers are adept at using psychology. I think um, a colleague uh, is speaking about that later. Create a sense of urgency, a fear of missing out on the deal. You need to safeguard your funds. A call to authority. They're calling from the bank. They're an official. They're a, they're a, they're a police officer. We see that quite a lot of impersonations. Uh, all, all the tricks of using psychology that actually are in the book that um, genuine marketers use. And then that core of legitimacy, spoofing the phone numbers, spoofing the websites, imitation of genuine companies creates that uh, air of legitimacy. Then the payment, creation of a new payee, so simple these days. Then an authorised push payment from the bank instantly out to an account. Then it's through many, many accounts, layered, and then out for an ATM in minutes. So all the mechanisms, are, and they all give us opportunities to intervene. So I think we need to understand the whole problem and start thinking, yes, phishing, anti-phishing, absolute up here, engagement, social engineering, consumer education, payment, how do we reduce the money mule accounts? So I think we need to look at it as a really kind of complex, multifaceted, holistic way and have all sorts of different tools. Um, so what's the plan? That's meant to be the plan. What are we doing about it? In the UK, I say a lot is going on. There are interventions, technical interventions, consumer education, uh, legislative um, and law enforcement actions. Interesting in the UK, and I don't know how widespread this is, but technical um, steps. There's something called confirmation of payee. So whenever a, re- a recipient bank holder, um, you know, whenever a, a bank account holder sets up a new payee or sends a payment, up will come a message to see if it's congruent with the receiving um, account. So if I'm thinking I'm sending it to Dana and it comes in and it says somebody else, 
I can start going, this does look right. Actually, it not right. So confirmation of pay. And I think now within the bank rails, we can start looking at what other information, such as have, do we know that that bank account is going to is owned by a scammer or has been seen in a fraud before. So that technology to give you some information around who is the payee, is, I think opens up other techniques. Dynamic messaging. So in now there are warnings in the moment of a, of a transfer. So it will come up on an app bank account in the UK. Are you sure you're sending, you know who you're sending this to? Have, is it for a ticket? Therefore, is it a scam? Because ticket scams quite a thing. Uh, do you know it? Is it friends and family? What's this about? So in the moment you're sending that to a new payee, it puts in your mind this could be a scam. Uh, and of course, then there's analytics on payments, quite a lot of really brilliant technology to look at behaviours whilst you're in the session. Uh, you know, do I normally use this, not just this device, but do I hold this device in a certain way? Is it me? Um, how long do I um, on, on, on that site normally? So quite a lot of technical issues around payments. Uh, and then we have quite a big, big issue in the UK around consumer protection. Something that's been implemented uh, on a voluntary basis called the contingent reimbursement model. Basically, it's a model for reimbursement of scam victims. This has put the onus of liability for paying the fraudster, let's face it, rather from away from the customer to the bank. That's £360 million that used to be stolen through Western <laughs> Union and the banks weren't concerned. Now, mostly they suffer that cost. I think this is a game changer because it means the banks now have to invest tens and hundreds of millions of pounds to stop this so that's a no blame return of scam funds it's going uh, our payment system regulator is now consulting on making that code mandatory i think it will be mandatory and there will be a high burden of proof on the bank to prove that the person um didn't not knowingly send that money so you, they have to have been completely reckless about it mainly it means they'll be paid out so the banks will continue to suffer much more um, in the UK, call blockers and also check a website. So we've set that up with Jorich because I think that's a great tool for people to know when they click on the link, is it genuine? We've created an organization called Stop Scams UK, which brings together the online platforms, the metas, the Googles with the banks and the telcos. That's initiated a number of things, including a number to call 159. So if you're in, in a call from what you think is from your bank, uh, you can check by phoning 159 to see whether that is the bank and it'll get you through. But legislation, we have something called the Online Harms Bill, Act of Parliament going through at the moment, which extends the regulation of content through uh, or to regulate harmful online content, including fraudulent user generated and paid for advertising. So we're looking forward to that. Education, we have something called the Take Five to Stop Fraud campaign. There's lots of consumer education, but that's one that I think we all get behind. And then lots of law enforcement action. So um, we we have uh, a City of London Police and our National Economic Crime Centre working together to map out the frauds, but also to take down people like courier frauds. We see quite a lot of uh, UK based courier frauds. Lastly, what needs to be done? Um, no, no questions. No questions. Um, so we are doing a lot in the UK, and I think some of that is making an impact. But there are five things in terms of a plan we still need to do. And I don't see a lot of this more broadly. Sharing of data about victims. Victims are often uh, repeat victims and they're often then reloading scams where someone comes to them and says, I know you've lost here. So they become repeat victims. We need to be sharing and cocooning repeat victims. Secondly, consumer awareness and education campaigns. We see a lot of money spent on here. Sometimes be a panacea, but does it work? We need more research into what actually works. Thirdly, effective methods for intelligence sharing. And I think we've seen some of that, let's say the APWG around the world. We need more single strategy across payments uh, and we need to invest stolen funds into more uh, which cannot be repatriated into counter fraud activity so lesson in the uk um you need to have many layers of defense um those initiatives are having some impact but fraud and scams are still rising but confirmation of payee dynamic messaging consumer education targeted law enforcement disruption takedown at scale all have their part but i think we need to up all of that activity as a whole because they're up in their game against us. Thank you.